If I could have your attention, please, we'll get started on our meeting. Stuart, mind if you want to have a seat and all the time, otherwise you can stand also, that's fine. Well, good evening. I'm Brent Frazier, Mayor of Pelican Rapids, and welcome to our second Complete Street Project Public Input Meeting. Uh, we're scheduled to meet here this evening from 7 to 8.30 p.m. We want to thank Lake Region Electric Cooperative for furnishing this building for this meeting. We want to thank each and every one of you for your participation this evening. What exciting times lie ahead for Pelican Rapids, and we know that uh, Mid-Dot District Four will be reconstructing highways 59 and 108 within the city limits in the year 2024. And we will also be replacing underground utilities. The 2024 project presents the city with an opportunity to improve highways 59 and 108 for all users, including motor vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, and people with disabilities. It is also the opportunity to make aesthetic improvements to our downtown. Now the display boards you see around you this evening in the back of the room are not the final drawings. We want to make sure that you know that we're past the starting point in this process, but we're still working in the process, but the final picture will be coming forth to the City Council in the month of September of 2019. A Partnership for Health has contracted with SRF to facilitate a public input process to help Pelican Rapids decide what we would like Highways 59 and 108 to look like after the project has been completed. Our first open house was on April 25th, the one this evening, and then there'll be another one, the third and final one in July. I'd like to introduce uh, Patrick Halster from Partnership for Health. Patrick, if you give a wave out so people know who you are, I'm gonna introduce some people. Uh, Stuart Crosby from SRF Consulting, and also Jonathan Fillmore from SRF. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, several months ago, an advisory committee was formed, and uh, we have met three times thus far. At this time, I'd like to introduce the advisory board committee members. I know some of them could not be here this evening, but if you were here when I call your name, if you would just stand, and after that, I'll, you can have a seat. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Tom Pace from MnDOT. District 4, Tom, in the back of the room. Kathy Reinerson from MidDOT District 4. Kathy. Uh, Mary Safgren, MidDOT District 4. Mary. Shane Butzler, MidDOT District 4. Not with us this evening, okay. Uh, we have Don Solga, City Administrator. Uh, Katie Martinez, she's the Chair of our Parks and department here in Pelican Rapids. She's also a high school art teacher and resident of Pelican Rapids. Rudy Martinez, <laughs> he works here in our school district, is also a resident. Mr. Wayne Hurley, West Central Initiative. Sean Donis, Minnesota DNR. Sean here this evening, I guess not. Uh, Pat Patrick Halster said for Steve Strand, city councilman, business owner, and also <laughs> resident of Pelican Rapids. We have Jim Schiff, he's an avid bicyclist and a resident of this community. I don't think Jim could be with us this evening either. Uh, Matt Stram, business owner and resident of this community. Uh, Dan Houston, Lake Region Electric Cooperative and also a resident of Pelican Rapids. Andrew Johnson, business owner, resident here in Pelican Rapids. Mr. Paul Evenson, Mendow Trucking and also a resident of Pelican Rapids. Don Perrin, who is a business owner in Pelican Rapids. I did not see Don, but he, I'll thank him for his uh, work with our committee. Uh, Brittany Dawkin, business owner, school board member, and also resident of Pelican Rapids. And Brian Olson, city street superintendent. So thank you all. Let's give them a hand for the <laughs> Well, SRF and the advisory committee have, have re revise the concept drawing based on the input that we received on the April 25th meeting. And the agenda for this evening is here on the board as you, as you witnessed. So there'll be a, definitely a different change in Pelican Rapids to the aesthetics of our downtown and business area. So this is an opportunity 
as a community as a whole to share in the voice and the planning of this process so we can have a final photo of what the downtown Pelican Rapids will look like. So what a great opportunity this is for each and every one of us within this room here this evening. We want to thank MnDOT for inviting our community to the table to help them with the, this planning process. Just as time to time when we do upgrades to our own personal property, our home, so does the city infrastructure and also the aesthetics of the city, and that's what we're here for this evening again. So we hope that those that come after us in future generations will say that uh, what a great uh, vision was that of the community of Pelican Rapids back in 2019 with the planning they did to give us what we would have to them. Yes, what exciting times we live in now and what exciting times for Pelican Rapids. As I said before, we'll have one more public meeting in July, SRF will be making their final presentation for recommendations to the City Council in September 2019. And also, if you have not already done so, please write your name and email address on the sign-in form by the desk, the table where you walked in. Uh, we want to have your email address to send you a reminder of that July open house. Again, thank you for your participation this evening and being with us and what exciting times lie before us and so we can pit paint a beautiful portrait of Pelican Rapids. Thank you again. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Stuart Crosby with SRF, and uh, what we will be doing this evening, as you see up here, is um, I want to go through all of the concepts for you and with you, and we'll have a time for all of us to talk together, questions and answers, hear people's input. Uh, we do have to be out of this room uh, at 8.30 with the cleanup so that the room is closed up by 9. So um, I would like to leave some time for everybody afterwards to spend a little time with the boards. We'll hand out some dots. That's a helpful exercise, I think, as one way to gauge some interest in the different concepts. So if things go according to schedule, we'll finish uh, the presentation on or before 7.45, and we'll have uh, as much time as we need up to um, 8.15 or so to do the group discussion. and then. We'll leave some time at the end for everybody to look at the boards. So the mayor went through the project purpose, but uh, a couple things I want to add to this. Um, this is a very, very um, great process, and starting it early like this is extremely helpful. It's helpful for a couple of reasons. One, it allows the community an opportunity to think ahead and to share ideas and come up with a, with a vision. That vision can be used in a number of ways and will be used in a number of ways. The city can take this document, this report, and use it to apply for grants to help offset some of the cost sharing costs because the future project that MnDOT is going to be designing um, will be covered in part by MnDOT, but there also will be some costs that will have to be borne uh, locally by the city. And uh, I can't get into those details yet because a lot of that isn't yet known. There are a lot of different uh, variables to that. But this type of a process and the document that comes out of it can be very beneficial in getting grant funding to offset that. The other thing is that MnDOT can use this document as a guideline for going forward in the design. That's not to say that what we are presenting and showing is going to be the be-all, end-all because there is a whole design development process that MnDOT needs to go through. So, Although we're showing um, input from the community in terms of lane widths and what people would like to see, that needs to go through a whole process that MnDOT will, um, will go through that will utilize this information, but some of the uh, dimensions that you see may change. But um, we have been in, in touch with MnDOT, and as we've heard, we have a lot of their representatives here tonight, so they're part of the process and we're getting their feedback. So those are, two, I think, the two main um, outcomes that, of this process that this process will have. And, as the mayor said, this is the second of uh, two, or excuse me, three public meetings, and we'll have a final presentation in September. There's the project advisory committee. Um, we have heard a lot of information from uh, folks that were at the last open house and other comments that were emailed in. And I wanted to show just a few of these up here to let people know that um, that information didn't just get tucked into a drawer. We actually pulled that out and um, worked with our committee to put up these new concepts right here. So um, it's an idea, it's an opportunity to rethink the landscape or the streetscapes of Pelican Rapids. 
One of the key things we heard is that people feel 11 foot lanes, which is what we were showing in our previous concepts or a couple of the options are too narrow and that wider drive lanes are desired to accommodate the larger trucks and some of the farm equipment that come through town. Parking stalls should be wider than uh, what would typically be around seven or eight feet, uh, eight, eight feet or more, and we had heard a lot that uh, 10 feet would be beneficial to accommodate the wider vehicles. Uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities are desired on both sides of the street, that comment came through uh, loud and clear, and trails seem to be desired more out of town with wider sidewalks in town. And I think the last one is, uh, is important, that some people are in favor of bike lanes downtown and some are not. And so what we're going to show you tonight are different options and we really are looking forward to your input, not only on these options, but any other ideas you might have. So the project extends as we went through before. We're looking at um, highways 108 and 59 through town and just a little bit beyond the, the limits of town. And um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through each of the different segments of town. And we're gonna start on Highway 108, Minnesota 108, west of 3rd Street, out to the outskirts of town, as you can see here on the map, this, this um, dash box right here. So we're gonna be on the west side of town. The existing conditions out there in a typical sense, so this is not necessarily what you see everywhere out there, but in a typical sense, what you see are two 12-foot through lanes with uh, paved shoulders, and open ditches out to the right of way. The input that we heard um, was to uh, incorporate trails, multi-use trails that would take traffic both directions on both sides and put those on the outside of the right of way separated by a little ditch. And so um, you still have the two 12 foot through lanes with the paved shoulders but the addition of trails on both sides of the, of the roadway. In plan view, this is what it would look like where you have your two 12 foot lanes, the green grass, uh, the green represents grass or that ditch, and then the 10 foot trail on both sides right here. Um, just so you know, the graphic, the image that we're using in the background is blurry, not necessarily on purpose, and it's not your eyes, but um, we, didn't, uh, we don't have access to a really uh, sharp aerial image, and so um, it, gives, it helps give a sense of where things are, but uh, it's not, we didn't blur it on purpose. So that's the west of 3rd Street section of 108. And as we move closer into town between 3rd Street and US 59, we have um, the existing conditions right here with the through lanes and the wider parking areas um, with sidewalks on both sides. And there are curb and gutters on both sides right there too. We have a couple of different options that we want you to look at and consider this evening. The first option is to have 12 foot through lanes with parking on both sides, the curb and gutter here. We're showing a five foot bike lane that has a buffer at the back of the curb separated from the sidewalk by a five foot boulevard right here. And so this has, uh, has the advantage of keeping the pedestrians and the bicyclists off the roadway and separated from each other. But we did hear in our committee that one other option that, we're, that we were interested in showing tonight is where you have uh, the separation between the curb and the, uh, the pedestrians and the bicyclists, uh, in between the curb and the, and the bike, sorry, I said that kind of backwards, but uh, one of the benefits of this is it provides an area for snow storage, so as the clouds come through in the winter, you have a place for that snow to go, rather than having the snow being plowed onto the bike lane and then having to remove it off of there. Um, that is one of the benefits. I think one of the things to consider is that when you put the bikes and the peds next to each other, you're essentially creating a trail-like situation, and with you can delineate that with some markings, but it is something to consider, especially as you're getting closer into where there are businesses and you have doors, we have to think about um, the space that is needed for people to go in and out and for doors to swing. So I think this is something that we'd like your input on, but as if this gets uh, chosen as more of the preferred alternative, we'll have to take a closer look at how this will work in areas where we have businesses. But a um, couple of different options for that. I wanted to show this as a plan view, and we're only showing one um, of the two options. This is the option that has the separation of the bikes and the sidewalk with the trees and the green in between. But what you see here are those drive lanes, the parking lanes, the curb, and then that bike lane behind the curb with the vegetation and then the sidewalks on the far outside. And it's the same on both sides. So. That's the third street between, uh, or one away between third street and 59. 
Now we're going to skip over to the other side of, uh, of 59, 108 between US 59 and 5th Street. And as you can see up here on the location map, um, the existing condition for that right now in a typical scenario is 12 foot through lanes with parking on both sides, pretty wide parking lanes with a sidewalk on the north side of the street. So there is no um, pedestrian facility on the south side of the street with the exception of that first block or so that's just off of 59. The input that we receive is that people like to have both the parking and the through lanes. They like to have the sidewalk on the south side, but there's a real desire to put a facility, sorry, a sidewalk on the north side, but there's a real desire to put a facility on the south side with that trail, that 10 foot trail. And so what we're showing here is the, uh, the trail um, at the, on top, you know, behind the curb with a little bit of room to put in some of the amenities like the street lights, et cetera. What that looks like is uh, a plan view like this where you have the existing conditions, which is the sidewalk, it's reconstructed, parking, the true through lanes, another parking lane, and then that trail that heads to the east out of town. And that connects to the segment that is on the outskirts of town, which is east of 5th Street. And the existing conditions on that in a typical situation is where you have the 12 foot through lanes and the paved shoulders with a wider right of way and no pedestrian facilities on the north side or the south side. And after showing the options in our last meeting, what we heard was that people were really excited and interested in having a paved trail on the south side of the street that would head out to the city limits. And so we would be going from having a sidewalk in the more urban part of this part of 108 to just having the trail on the south side that would extend further out. And what that would look like in plan view is right here where you have the roadway, separation of a little ditch, and then that trail and that heads out right now. And it, as it gets out toward the end of the city, it probably would just terminate um, at an intersection, and we're not exactly sure where yet, we can take a closer look at that. But it does provide an opportunity for people to head out and back, and if you're living out that way or have business out that way, it does give you an option for traveling either on foot or a bicycle. So that's the, the, the few segments on 108. Now we're gonna switch to Highway uh, US 59, and we're gonna start on the south side of town and work our way north through town. And the first segment that we're going to look at is uh, south of Fifth Avenue, and that existing segment has um, the two through lanes and the paved shoulders and a ditch separation on both sides, but there is that existing paved trail that starts right outside here at uh, Lake Region and heads north into town. So that's the existing condition. The proposed alternative that got the most favor in uh, the previous meeting and some of the feedback we got, people like to have that trail on, sorry, on the east side but there is a desire to add a sidewalk on the west side, and partially I think that is because there's a, it could connect easier with the school on the west side. Um, there are some businesses and uh, additional development that may be occurring on that side, so uh, generally people felt that it would be important to have a pedestrian facility on that west side. And it, it, it's possible that it could be separated from the roadway uh, by the ditch. What that would look like in plan view, here you have the road hasn't changed from what it's showing right now, or is right now, and that trail that is up the east side, but the, exist, uh, the addition of a sidewalk on the west side of the street. As we head north between 5th and 3rd avenues, um, we'll do a slight uh, transition. I want to first show you what, out, what is out there and existing, and that is uh, through lanes, and this is in the uh, Front of the school, the lanes are actually a little, the existing lanes are a little narrower there. There's parking on the uh, east side, no parking on the west side for the segment in front of the school, but there are sidewalks on both sides of the street. We have two different options, and this is similar to what I showed you on 108, um, where we include bike lanes on the back of the curb with some separation between the sidewalk with landscape, which is kind of similar to what's out there today, where you have some separation between the curb and the sidewalk, but there is a bike lane in the middle of those. And that is the same on both sides. So you have bike lane, landscape zone, and sidewalk. Note also the 12 foot through lanes that we're putting in there as a recommendation to get through town. The other option has, uh, similarly to what we showed before, the same 12 through lanes, the parking, and then a boulevard where you could have vegetation, some trees planted, the street lights, 
and then a trail, a 10-foot trail, essentially, that would accommodate both bicyclists and pedestrians. And that is the same on both sides. In plan view, uh, the first option, where you have uh, the street with the two 12-foot lanes, the parking, and then that bicycle lane that's on the back side of the curb, separation for the trees, and then the sidewalk, and that's on the both sides. So that's an example of what this would look like right here. Moving north, now we're in the downtown area between, uh, really that area between the stoplights and maybe a the signal a little bit further north and south, um, as you can see in the box right here. Um, we have a couple of different options we want to show. This is the existing condition where you have um, the through lanes, which are very wide right now at 18 feet, and then uh, 10 foot parking or parking on both sides with sidewalks that range in width from 11 to 13 feet, depending on where you are downtown. One of the options is to uh, increase the width of the through lanes to 12, or keep maintain, sorry, reduce the width of the through lanes in downtown to 12 feet, um, keep the parking at 10 feet on both sides, which shrinks up the, the width of the roadway and provides more room to put a bike lane that's buffered um, on the back of the curb with the sidewalk uh, closer to the, to the building facades. And we have a wider sidewalk here at 10 feet. Um, as you walk through town now, it is really nice to have that wider sidewalk, and that's something that we'd like to see maintained through town if we could. Um, so this option would have that. The second option that we want to show, well first I want to show you uh, the plan view for that, which would have by your through lanes and parking, with the curb and the uh, bike lane and uh, the sidewalk behind it right there. Option two switches things around a little bit. You still have the through lanes, the 12 foot through lanes, but between the through lanes and the parking, you have a five foot bike lane and a two foot buffer that separates the drive lanes from the parking. So the bikes are on the street, not on the back of the curb. And you have the sidewalk uh, right up to the back of the curb in a condition that's similar to what's out there today. So option two has the bikes on the road, option one has the bikes behind the curb off the road. And we're showing that the same on both sides with bike lanes on both sides. In plan view, this is what it looks like where you have your through lanes and you see that bike lane that's right here uh, that has uh, the delineation with those, those solid white lines, the parking, and then those wider sidewalks. should also mention that the downtown right now has a crosswalk, a mid-block crosswalk, and as I can tell, it's an inoperable uh, light above it. One of the things that could go in in that location, if it's desired to have that mid-block crosswalk, which I think is pretty important right downtown, is to put in a rapid flashing beacon, and that is a type of beacon where you activate it by pushing a button, and then the lights flash, indicating that there are pedestrians that are about to enter the crosswalk. So now we're moving outside of town, we're going north um, on 2nd Avenue up to County Road 9, and this is in the area that is up by the turkey plant on the west, and as you recall in that area, we have a sidewalk on the east side in the existing condition. We have three lanes that are 12 feet, and we have parking on both sides of the street, although as you click closer to the, the turkey plant, parking on the west side uh, stops, and they just have it as a shoulder there. But one thing of note is that there is no pedestrian access on the west side. And so I'd say one of the comments we heard most throughout our last meeting was that there was a real interest in getting facilities for people to walk and or bicycle on the west side. And that's what we're showing in our first proposed option here, where we maintain the through lanes and the parking or the shoulders, depending on where parking is allowed. Um, at 12 feet through and 10 feet for parking, but we have a bike lane at the back of the curb and also separation with trees and a sidewalk on the outside. And that is on both sides, so what's new in this is from existing, we're showing both a bike lane and a sidewalk on the west side heading out of town. The second option is where we have again 12 foot through lanes, 10 foot parking, we have a boulevard, so you have the plantings, the vegetation right up, up against the back of the curb, and then you combine the pedestrians and the bicyclists in a, in a combined facility that would act more like a trail, and it could be asphalt, or it could be uh, something that looks more like a sidewalk that would be concrete, but most likely would have to be striped uh, so that people know 
to walk or bike on, on one side or the other. And again, based on the input we heard, there's a real desire to have both a facility for walking and biking on the east side as well as the west side. In plan view, um, this is what the first option looks like, where you have uh, the road through lanes, parking, and then on the back curb you have the, the bike lane separation and then the sidewalk, and that's the same on both sides. So heading out of town north of County Road 9, this is where the right-of-way widens quite a bit. And as you can see in the existing condition, we have uh, the through lanes, the 12-foot through lanes, and uh, the wider paved shoulders here, and then a, a large ditch. Um, our proposal, based on feedback that we got, was to incorporate a trail on both the east side and the west side, which would allow people to move up and down depending on which side of the street they were on, and, uh, and provides an opportunity for uh, options in the winter where the city could opt to plow one side for winter use for walking and biking or keep one side unplowed for uh, snowmobiling or other winter activities. In plan view, this is what it would look like where you have uh, the, the main roadway through here with two drive lanes, one in each direction, paved shoulders, separation, and then that trail in both directions. And the trail would be um, multi-use in, in the sense that you would stripe it or could stripe it so that you have uh, the ability to go out and back on both sides so it would be two-way traffic on both sides it wouldn't be one way out sorry one way out and uh, one way back but you would have two-way traffic on both sides for those trails so that's a lot of information that I just went through um, the last thing that I want to leave you with before we have a discussion and questions is our schedule. We talked about this earlier. We are here at the second uh, open house, and uh, we have a third open house, our final open house, is scheduled to be at the high school on July 18th, and we'll be sending more information out about that. What we would like to, or we plan on showing at that, is uh, some final recommendations of a concept that is based on input from both the, both the first meeting, but also this meeting as well, and any additional input we get. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to join us uh, for that July 18th meeting. And with that, I think I will pause and see if there are any comments or questions. And it's now 7.42, so we did that a little bit early. What is uh, traffic count on Highway 59? And is it increasing or decreasing from year to year? That is a question I do not have an answer for, and I'm wondering if anybody at the city knows the traffic counts for 59, whether or not they're increasing or decreasing. I know it's forecast to increase. I don't remember the numbers offhand. Is the forecast to make an increase over the next decade? Well, we, we can see if we can get some of that information from uh, some of the data that's out there. But unfortunately, so we, I think yeah. when we did some of our planning for the county, the ADT on it north of town we measured was like 66, 6700 a day um, was the number that comes to mind if I recall correctly. We did, we did because of County Road 9 and doing some of the work there, the county kind of pulled that data in just to see what was happening. Okay, great, thank you. Question back here? Yes. One thing that I brought up last time and it's not even addressed is when people want to turn from 59 either east or west on 108, there's no turning lanes and it really gets clogged up. So the, the topic of turning lanes is my understanding that that was um, discussed and reviewed by the city um, a while back and um, I, I don't really have, I wasn't a part of that conversation, but I know that that was something that was addressed, and for the purpose of this uh, process, um, one of our intents was to show through lanes, but not having those turn lanes. We just don't have the uh, the background that was done in that other that other uh, process. Is that right, Tom? Yeah. 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 To answer that question, you know, from what I recall, the main the main concern that the council had at the time was with the traffic lanes at the intersections or the left turn lanes at the intersections there was the concern about losing downtown parking 
when you put those lanes in. And obviously MnDOT, when they showed the concept of doing it, they just had a, a left-hand turn lane all the way down from one light to the other. It was one solid one. And so that concept, because of the, 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 the additional width it was going to take all the way through, we didn't like that, or the council at the time didn't like that. But it was also the main, one of the main concerns with the loss of parallel parking along the streets because parking is such a, such a premium down there. But one of the things I want to throw out there that we kind of touched on at one of our meetings was, and it doesn't show it on these because a lot of these concepts are just showing generally what you see. But the thought about if we were to put in a left-hand turn lane at each intersection, how does the community think about in order so that cars could get around that left turn lane, losing a parallel parking space or two on each side of the road at that intersection. To put turn lanes in, we would have to lose some parallel parking. Is they that acceptable? No, they do with other communities. So. Well, that's the other thing that I, I have. I want to talk to Mintot about this because is there a way with the existing lighting that we have, street lighting that we have now, to keep what we have, but control it by, a different, maybe it's a different street light, but we can have the same concepts, but the light basically does not turn green for the north-south traffic at the same time. Maybe there's a left turn arrow that lets left turn traffic go first, and maybe 10, 20 seconds later or whatever, then the other, the other direction turns green. That's something that, if that's possible, we should think about. But the other idea is if that's not possible for whatever reason here, the other option would be to lose some um, parallel parking at the intersection to, to look at the concept anyway of making a left turn lane. Okay. I guess one of my biggest concerns with the plan still is how do you do deliveries downtown? Right in the lanes, and that's a good thing. Uh, you know, right now, on a daily basis, we have dozens of deliveries through the downtown business district of UPS, FedEx, Speedy, Pepsi, um, you know, different vendors going through. A lot of your downtown businesses don't have a rear entrance um, through the river, and there's no through roads behind it. So, you know, one of the concerns right now, near the street, can these delivery vehicles park and stop? And deliver things without stopping traffic. I know it was also brought up in the committee, it's not legal for them to do that to begin with, but it's realistic. It happens, it needs to happen. Yeah. No, that's, that's true. And the concern about parking of uh, delivery vehicles in downtown, if you have narrower drive lanes, uh, what happens? And I think um, that it, it is a concern, and, it, and uh, legal or not, it does happen. Um, I think in other communities, one of the situations is that they, if there are open parking spaces, they can pull in there. Um, if, there's, if there's a bike lane, um, that can be used temporarily for that, pers that purpose. But you know, there are also other times when it just does block traffic. But I think that as you're narrowing things, there, there isn't room for everything. And that is, that is a concern. At the last meeting, and there was talk from MnDOT about the minimum buffer requirements for bike lane between traffic and parking. Mm -hmm. Did you get any headway on that? Yeah, we did. We took a look at that, and um, the the preferred width for a bike lane if it's on street and there's parking between uh, the drive lane and the bike lane. So if you have parking, parallel parking, and that bike lane is next to it, the preferred width is six feet. You can go down to a five foot, but you can buffer on just one side on the drive lane side. And it's, if there's room, it's ideal to buffer, to buffer on both sides. But in a, in a concept like this, where we're showing 10 foot wide parking space, um, it made sense to buffer on the drive side so that you had a little bit more buffer between the vehicles and the bicyclists. Because there is a fair amount of room in a 10 foot wide stall for people opening doors and bikes to maneuver around that. Sure. Can you go to that, that concept? Yeah. This one? So what we were talking about is um, the through lanes. 
this space right here is a two foot buffer, so it's a, it's a striped area that is really in a no man's land between the bike lane here and that parking. And what we're showing here is a five foot lane. Ideally, we could have a six foot lane, but um, one of the desires is to have the wider parking bay. And if you have the wider parking bay with the uh, amount of right of way that we have here and a desire to keep a little wider sidewalks, um, we have in this option shown a five foot uh, bike lane with that buffer. Is there any question or comment about that? I mean, is that something that's preferred? Okay, Wayne? Just, just a thought is if I understand the desire for 10 foot parking, however, as I drive through town and observe, it seems like people hug the, the, the away from the curb side, not the curb side. Um, and so if you were to narrow that to nine, standard is eight, is that a fair statement? So if you were to narrow that to nine, then all of a sudden that becomes six, with two feet is eight, now you could more easily potentially park a delivery vehicle there, interim, you know, and, and still, it, so you got eight feet for the truck, right? Mm -hmm. And you've still got 12 foot for people to go, for trucks to go by, which is doable, in my opinion, um, by losing one foot of, one foot of parking and going to nine, which is, I believe, still bigger than standard. Standard, yeah. And I think that that's, that's a good idea, and I've written just, that down. Just yeah. a yeah. question or a suggestion yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So. One thing I wanted to add to that, and I'll get to your question or comment in a second, is um, in conversations as we're putting these together, that 10-foot parking bay is really a, a desire of the community. I think that that is one thing that, um, as, as was just mentioned, uh, eight feet is more the standard, uh, nine feet is, is wide, 10 feet is really wide. And so I think that um, the recommendation from the community to MnDOT as the design goes forward is 10 feet. That may need to change for a number of reasons, but um, I, I think that, that there's, a, there's an opportunity here for more space for other, op, for other uh, uh, bikes or room for uh, temporarily parked vehicles. Just to add to Wayne's comment, if you did run it down to nine feet, perhaps it would want people to, people wouldn't hug the line, they'd hug more of the curbside. Mm -hmm. But uh, mine was, uh, I like the uh, compromise you have here. How are you transition from going to a, a sidewalk with the bicyclists going down to the, to the center of the road? Yeah, it's a good question. So how do you transition from a bike lane that's on the road to where you have the bike lane or the trail or sidewalk on the off side of the road? Um, I don't know if I have anything that shows that well, but um, generally what happens is that that transition has to happen at an intersection where you have um, a, you have a pedestrian ramp at that sidewalk or at the bike lane, and that way you can direct uh, pedestrians to go straight onto the sidewalk. And then when it's when you're heading into town and you have that bike lane, you can, um, if you're going in that direction, just continue down the bike lane. If you need to go to the other side to get to the bike lane to go the other direction, you're at that intersection, and so you can cross that crosswalk. I guess to add to that, uh, when you, and, and I understand the bicyclists, they, they know the, the rules and what we're taught to follow it. When you come up to a, a stop sign or stoplight, I should say, if you're going down the sidewalk, so you don't shoot over, and now you're into uh, regular traffic. Mm -hmm. I guess that would be my concern with the safety of the idea where maybe they should push to have the bicycle lane going down alongside the, the drive, the drive of the, the yeah. road. In the, in the road, yes. Yeah, so you're saying, yeah, okay. One other consideration on the park and the 10 foot, I think nine foot in the summer is probably adequate, but snow removal in the winter, um, you know, sometimes we'll go two weeks without having snow removed from the city street, you know, the piles removed from the streets, you know, and you're talking a five, six foot wide burn, just you know, city maintenance. Um, and with that, your 10 foot wide parking spot goes to eight foot, seven foot, however much. Not existing. And the rest of it goes on the sidewalk. Yeah. And you're getting narrower. So the winter is more of a concern in the summer. Sure. So winter for snow storage. One, one second, Katie, we have one comment here. Yeah. I like the downtown plan with the bicycle lanes between the traffic lanes and the parking the best. And I hate it when you mix 
pedestrians and bicyclers because bicycles are silent and pedestrians do unpredictable things and to me it's always and I've done a lot of bicycling it's always very dangerous to mix bicyclers and pedestrians okay good so this is what this is the yes this, that's the concept a much that better learned. plan than the other one okay thank you for the input okay um I just had a, uh, two questions real quick one was on um, regarding the parking so eight because I don't I'm not like I'm just asking a question um, if eight foot is standard nine foot was mentioned ten foot with like the snow removals do you know in other communities around us what maybe they're doing because they would have the same snow removal or I was just curious you really know about that other but communities I, close by I know that snow removal is a challenge um, and it's it becomes a real challenge uh, when you have multiple snow events and if you have parked cars and you have to go around them so it, it really is uh, it's a it's a maintenance process and um, you know there are some communities that push all the snow into the middle of the street if they have that room but uh, generally speaking it's a it's a sequence of events where you have to clear the vehicles and then remove that snow is there anything Don, that the city has special uh, in their process that, for snow removal I know that well, we have, we have basically a sidewalk district area now that the city maintains, but like I said at the last meeting, as we develop these concepts and as we change things, that's one of the things we're going to have to look at. You know, Matt mentioned the, the snow removal downtown, and, you know, yeah, sometimes it takes us longer depending on the timing of the snow and everything else to get it out of there, but we're going to have to look at all that because based on how things sh shake out on this project, you know, maybe the city council looks at that policy and, and, and where we, how that sidewalk district changes to incorporate more because we're putting in more and how we deal with the downtown based on what we're doing here too, that all might have, definitely have to be looked at to change. Um, I don't know if that answers the question necessarily, but yeah. Uh, to, to, if I could, to Steve's point about having the, the bike lane and the pedestrian separated, one of the, when we were talking about that in the other drawings and the other concepts, and the, the benefit of doing that, obviously, is the efficiency of the snow plowing. Matt brought this up at the meeting. When you have them together like that, as opposed to being separated by some type of a buffer, trees, whatever it is, um, vegetation, then you've got essentially two paths to take care of and it's slower than getting it done. Having them together, it, 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 it makes snow removal much more efficient. But the other thing too is, you would mention at the meeting that when you have them both on a 10 foot path, you typically strike and one side is marked clearly, this is the bicycle side, this is the pedestrian side, and you hope that everybody honors that to kind of keep the separation. Yeah, if it's just a 10 foot path and everybody is a free for all, but I think having it marked creates some order. And that's the, the other benefit of having it where you've got um, both of them on one side you're able to take that traffic away from the cars and the curb, and even though there's a two foot buffer there, whatever that buffer was by the curb, people opening their doors, you don't have to worry about a bicyclist coming by or, or whatever too. So there's some pros and cons to it, but if it's strike, it, it creates an efficiency and I think a little bit more safety factor and peace of mind to parallel parkers along that trail. I, I think in, in, in addition to that, something that has to be considered and will be looked at is, if you have them combined uh, and it's a, uh, a combination sidewalk or bike trail, we have to look at the width that is available because for ADA purposes, uh, the sidewalk has to be wide enough um, and uh, you know, there, there are certain standards for that, but especially where doors are opening from businesses, so you have to make sure there's room for that sidewalk component as well as bike lanes in both directions. And so um, it may be that there is or isn't enough room, we just have to look at that closer. I mean, I think with um, if you have an eight-foot sidewalk, which is desired downtown, and you have doors like that, to then add uh, four feet in each direction or more for bicycles, that's quite a lot of space. So something to consider. Kate, Kate did you have one other question? Um, yeah, I think I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, just we, I think it was mentioned at the first meeting, and I just wanted to, it, it's not in your concept drawing, and actually I talked to Tom about it. Um, the cross 
crosswalk that's downtown doing something like a curb that curves out so that the people standing in that crosswalk are not in between two cars but are actually visible to moving traffic? Is that been, do you have a picture of that? Has that been considered or is that not on the table? That is something that uh, has been discussed at the committee. Okay. And um, I think it is something that is on the table and has been considered. Um, it, for the, the scope that we have in our in our project, we really didn't have time to look in depth at that, but I do think that that is a viable alternative. So the bump out there to reduce the width of that um, does have impacts for parking, and also if it's if it's closer to intersections uh, for turning movements or turning radiuses. But that is something I think that is uh, yeah, and a I'm possibility specifically at the crosswalk, midtown yeah, crosswalk, the mid block crosswalk, because that's where it's really hard to see people stand between cars. Yeah. yeah point. How wide are the sidewalks right now? The sidewalks downtown um, are anywhere between 11 and 13 feet wide, depending on where downtown. At the present time. At the present time, correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. It's more just commentary. Um, the, the reworks are really appreciated. Um, I, I think that there has been a definite uh, need to accommodate large vehicles downtown. The reworks are appreciated. I really appreciate the um, pathways on the north end of town. I regularly and routinely see people walking in the street, and they're going out to the grocery store um, and coming all the way back up to the north end of town. Having that, whether they're walking or biking with their groceries, having that is going to be so much safer for people that are, are pedestrians or bikes. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Do we, with this, with this picture here, do we imagine the children riding bikes on the sidewalk, or, or the, do we somehow, is it safe for children to ride bikes on the lane when there's, you know, in this kind of bike lane when there's big trucks coming by? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, the, the bike lane is there for bicyclists to use, but it really is, uh, it, it would be a concern for me to have my children riding on that, and so, I think that it's most likely that if, if, if I were a parent and my kids I knew were biking down there, um, I would rather have them on the sidewalk, either walking or otherwise. Kate, did you want to? Um, I'm just going to say we really talked about that at the advisory committee a lot, and um, if you go to the other pictures, that would be okay. Yeah. It's just kind of the pros and cons, so this would be maybe one of the pros to this one, even though there obviously are cons to this also. It keeps children then at the same level of the sidewalk and out of the street. Um, we did touch on that. We also then said that takes away from um, other amenities that were being discussed at the last meeting. So um, I think compromise is the main thing we were trying to find. Um, and so that's why, you know, this one would be better for that particular situation. If you would go back to the other one. Um, and yeah, they were in the street then and then I mean, it would be a situational thing in the family, so not as ideal for this particular situation. I think the other thing to talk about that with respect to compromise and some of the concepts, the downtown area is really the only place we're looking at bike lanes in the street. All the other concepts have at the back of the curb uh, in one fashion or another. So, and, and I think that's an important distinction to make. Down the other thing that we talked about too was, uh, you know, the concept of putting the, the pedestrian or the bike lanes behind the stores. And one of the things that we, we throw around there is if you've got the bike lanes behind the stores, how much of that bike traffic is really going to go behind the stores? I'm talking about just local kids and families as opposed to if, you know going back through the downtown again because they're going to one of the stores or whatever. So that's kind of one of the other things we tossed around is if we don't do anything down there and we put them behind the stores, is that still going to, are we still going to have bike traffic through the downtown area? on the street or on the side. The other thing um, that we had talked about at the committee was, with that being said, with the talk of the Pelican to Perm bike trail, DL to Fergus, there's all these opportunities of real trails coming in to connect with communities um, to then keep them going. If it is that DL to Fergus one, um, then this can just bring them straight through our downtown um, to hopefully stop other businesses and enjoy them rather than fear them. Um, but also we hope this is then a compromise because it is then wider if we need to use the bike lane for something else in temporary use. I have a question, yeah. but on the outside trails, I'm 
being specifically like one away from now, are those city maintained like through the winter as far as when they go through private properties? Or is it the whole thing is responsible for snow removal and that type of thing? Well, I think that if you look at, let's look at um, one of the examples on the west side of town here. We gotta go way back though to do that. Like right out here. Um, in this situation, is this what you're thinking right here? Yeah, either yeah. way. Okay, well, so, my yeah. so. <laughs> the, what we're showing here is, in this area, there's a wider right-of-way, and so those trails would actually be in the public right-of-way. And so, um, I think that, Don was talking about that earlier, about the, the discussion that the council will have to have about increasing the amount of uh, facility that is covered for winter maintenance, because it would obviously, if you have trails like this, there may be a desire to have one or both sides plowed for winter use for walking or biking, but that does increase the maintenance time and cost to do that. So my question is on the other side of Monoway, on the east side, it's proposed to go through personal property versus oh. just out on the highway, mm -hmm. and so that's just, like, you know. On this, on this concept right here? Oh, um, even further out, sorry. This one, yeah. No, well, both of them, actually. Okay. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a, one of those things that in design development would have to be looked at really closely at to what the right of way is and what the type of right of way if it's an easement and um, but again I think that it would it would likely be a public facility that um, would be put in place with an agreement if it wasn't public right of way and then a discussion at the council level about uh, and I'm just coming up with an idea or thought here that it would have to be uh, determined where and how much would be maintained. Yeah, and just to add to, to that, too, and maybe just, just understand a little bit more. Generally, you have private property that's in the, in the right of way, and that's where a lot of the sidewalks are now. So we have a specific sidewalk district, and that's generally the, to the downtown area, going east and west of 108 in front of some of the stores and that sort of thing, up by the high school. In that site, designated sidewalk district, the city maintains that when there's a two inch snowfall. Prior to that, even in the sidewalk district, the property owners, the store owners are responsible for the sidewalk. Where we don't have that sidewalk district, all the pro all the residents in that, that have sidewalks, they're always responsible for it. But again, what I, what I referred to earlier was, when we do this, there's a specific reason why we're doing all this. And so part of it has to, we have to look at, the council has to look at, do we want to expand or should we expand that sidewalk district to now, like you were talking about, plow and where are we going to plow the snow when we have two inches or, or maybe we even change the way we look at that too. Well, I think we'd be careful with that two inch number. That's two inches in one shot. So we could have one inch and a half for 100 days straight, they wouldn't put it. That, that's not necessarily the case. But it was last year. Another comment over here? Question? Have you looked at um, doing in just the downtown section a uh, bike path on just one side up by the sidewalk and you know to leave enough room for delivery trucks and things? Yeah, we, we did at one of our first committee meetings. We looked at a bunch of different options, and one of the um, the reasons we didn't show that is that um, if you put a two way bike facility on one side of the road, people still will be biking and want to bike on the other, and so. It does, it does provide that opportunity, but it doesn't necessarily um, get the result that you need or want for bikers downtown. And so um, the committee felt that it was better to have a, a bike facility going in the direction of traffic on each side. So on the downtown portion, you show no vegetation. You feel like no vegetation or trees could happen without reducing the sidewalk from 11 feet. So I think that's a good question. Vegetation downtown. Um, I think that it, it is possible to put in tree, uh, tree pits or planters um, and still have a uh, viable sidewalk in there, but it does reduce that area. And so we have to look at which option gets carried forward and if it's possible to do that. Um, it's, at the committee, we, you know, we did talk about that. and. Um, the, the thought was to keep the sidewalks open, but there was a, some, a lot of interest, I would say, by people in trying to get some of that vegetation downtown. Some of the challenges, though, with vegetation downtown, uh, yeah, it, trees drop leaves and leaves um, become slippery and are another maintenance issue, and there are some concerns with store owners that as a tree grows up, it can block their signage or their frontage, 
So it isn't necessarily just a beautification, which they, people generally like them, but it comes with maintenance and other concerns that have to be considered. So. And also, some, there's more positives. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, but there are a lot of positive shades for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's probably the number one thing. Mm -hmm. And shade, and it, it's cooler, and it's a, it's a it's a nicer, softer aesthetic, which tends to slow down traffic. One thing I, I love trees, but. As they grow, their roots really can mess up sidewalks. And some places where they're planted, there isn't really even enough room for their root systems. You look at Fergus put in trees, but then they took them out. We talked about that at the committee level, just okay. And um, there are there are lists that have been developed by MnDOT and by uh, the North Dakota DOT for trees that are hardy for streetscapes in northern climates and. I think that's one of the things that if trees are decided to put down there to make sure that the species is appropriate for the location so you don't get the die off and you don't get um, the roots coming up and busting up the sidewalk. And you also um, have to make sure they're planted properly and have the proper maintenance. That's what I was going to say that um, there's lists and you don't have to reinvent it because we can look at other communities that are successful. We talked about that a little bit as a committee um, to look at trees that aren't. Um, yeah, quite so maintenance heavy or um, roots problems, things like that. It would be a lot of homework before we would move forward with it. Mr. Schubert, if I could address that. I talked to the forester of the city of Fergus Falls and they cut down all their trees downtown in the business district, but they are replacing them with a Japanese lilac that doesn't have the root system that the other trees have in the past. So they are replacing them. It's about 8.11 right now, and I'm happy to chat for a while longer, but I also want to give people the opportunity, if they'd like to, to go back and look at the boards and provide dots. Patrick has some dots to hand out like we did last time. So um, not last call, but if there are any other comments, let's uh, keep it going. And, and I also, we have had a couple of good comments about out of town and the trails. If there are any other thoughts about that, about a preference for um, trails on both sides or a sidewalk on the south side of town and a trail on one side um, We'd love to have some input on that, too The one comment or question that I'd like to see People kind of address either through comments or whatever it seems like in a lot of our areas It's very easy to, 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 to come up with what the concept should be up on the 108 and stuff but downtown is really the problem that, that needs the most discussion and thought. And so you, you have the option of the trails around the stores, you have the bikes up on the sidewalks, and you have the, the bikes down on the, on the drive level. I'd like to know from people what they prefer as far as, you know, do you, do you like the safety of your kids being up on the sidewalk, or do you, are you fine with it being down the driveway? And pros and cons for both of those. And that's the one that we really want to hear about all of them. That one too, because that's the one we all struggle with. There's so many pros and cons about it, whatever concept we look at for downtown. So share your thoughts on that one for sure. Yeah. I think me as a parent, you know, the, the bicycle lane in the roadway makes more sense for truck traffic and whatnot. As a parent, I would teach my kid to avoid downtown and take a back road to get to the pool um, and things like that. So, but. There's other kids that are going to do what they want to do, or they're coming biking from out of town. And, you know, it's a concern. But for me, living in town, you know, I would teach my kids the safe areas of town to bike. One thing we haven't talked about tonight, we talked a bit about it at the committee level, is that introducing bike facilities downtown, either on street or, or back to curb, we're going to have to also think about where people are going to park those and so putting in bike racks and making sure that people aren't just leaving their bikes anywhere um, some some of the other thoughts and considerations and, um, and having bike racks in the appropriate locations is also something that uh, that we'll give some thought to but um, introducing bikes is a great idea downtown i personally think but you have to make sure that you provide locations for people to park those bicycles the north portion on uh, 59, does that go all the way to the Prairie Lake access? 
on the north side, it um, it would go all the way to the city limits. Is that, that probably not that? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Okay. Almost, yeah. Okay. We could do that. I think it makes sense to do that. Yeah. On the north side, go all the way to Prairie Lake Access? To the river. To the river, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I actually I have a question the crowd would think about, and that is, so on the south side right now, there's only a trail on one side, and you've got concepts of both. Does that make sense going north on 59 up to the access area that you just stay on one side, or does, does the general public think that it would be better to have it on both sides of the highway all the way to the Prairie Lake Access? I think Prairie Lake Access makes a perfect spot to stop. The problem is it's on the north side. Yeah. You know, so, but I mean, for just for an average person to go for a walk, walk out to the river, turn around, walk back, or whatever, I think that would be a marvelous thing for health. Patrick, I'll throw one in for you. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but again, I'm um, not sure what everyone, I'm kind of curious about that and what people think about that. Okay, good question. Well, to add to that, we were, the city was actually given some land on the south side years ago to, to make a trailhead. And that's not much beyond the logic field on the south side. Oh. So maybe we can look at doing that loop right here mm -hmm. because of the natural uh, of the uh, trailhead that we're trying to create. <laughs> That's a good point. I, one thing I wanted to mention is that when you are when you're looking at trails on the outskirts of town uh, or sidewalks, the question came up at our committee: Could we put in crosswalks out there? Um, and uh, there are there are limitations based on speed and other things for where you can and can't put crosswalks. And it's unlikely when the speed limit is higher uh, in those outlying areas that a crosswalk would be allowed. But uh, signage potentially for uh, a pedestrian crossing area might be something, but crosswalk may not work. Any, uh, any, any last comments for the whole group? We will be happy to continue our conversation, but um, I don't want to count anybody uh, or stop anybody from talking, although I do hear the vacuum in the background. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I really want to thank you all for your input. Patrick has to, uh, some dots. Do you want to give a little bit of some ground rules? Okay, it's dot voting time. So those of you who were here on April 25th, it works exactly the same way tonight. So we have 10 boards around the room for you to vote on. They are the two boards to the left of the back doors, the two boards to the right of the back doors, and the six boards on the side here. Each person can have up to 10 dots. The colors of the dots are meaningless. All the dots mean the same thing regardless of their color. Basically, we just want you for each, and you don't have to vote on each board, but for any particular board, please vote only once per person. Uh, we want you to put a dot at the drawing, drawing like this. We call this an elevation or a profile. Uh, put the dot on the drawing like this that you like the most. You always have the option of voting for the status quo. So every board, each one of the 10 boards has a drawing that says existing. That's what it is right now. If you prefer the way it is right now, go ahead and put your dot there. If you like one of the other options, then please put your dot on that option. Um, please vote, space is kind of limited on the boards. So just like April 25th, uh, if possible, please vote in the sky. And the reason I say please vote in the sky or please put your dot in the sky is because we don't want you covering up any of the people, vehicles, or numbers because we want everybody to be able to see those. Now, given the number of people in the room and given how small the images are, we might run out of room in the sky pretty quickly. So then I would say just do your best. Just put it somewhere where it's obvious to us what, which one you're voting for. And once again, I'd like help from Wayne Scott and Jonathan for dot distribution.